something that was always clear to me working with you in class was how focused you were, how, how clear your North Star of really what I care about, success and excellence and um, getting out there. And um, you're hungry and you've made it happen and you're blowing up and I couldn't be more happy for you and, and more proud that I um, was part of your journey and that we continue to connect, yeah. I always felt like you were somebody that I could trust. And I was at this point in my life, in my career, where I was like, you know, what kind of actor do I want to be? And like, what kind of work do I want to do? And what, what can I bring to the world that, you know, isn't already there? You know, what, what's the mark that I'm going to like make? And, uh, you know, when I was first in class, I felt like I just want to focus on being the best actor that I can be. And I felt like I never really had the training that would allow me to do that. And when I got into the class, we started doing all this personal work. I started to realize that in order to be the best actor I could be, I'd have to like really understand myself and confront things within me, blocks that I had and like where the blocks came from, get into therapy and start to piece that together and like process it and then start to work with it and give myself permission to work with these parts of myself that, you know, I've kind of closed off, you know, either as a survival tactic or because I just didn't have the room or skills to really work through it. And I found that through acting, I could kind of work through some things in doing so, but I just needed to, to figure out how and understand what that would mean for me in terms of a career because you know early early on when I started I think it was like 2011 2010 there were no real trans roles there certainly weren't any trans masculine roles so it's like I would be coming out for what to just be seen as this one thing that no one seems to have a story for or until I write these stories or like get with someone where I could like make these stories and write it then I could do it Whereas like I, I need to get the practice in first and I want to get my feet into the industry and like work so I, I didn't want to do that and then you know, what, what's interesting about where we're at now is, is like you're saying, like in, in your new classes, you know, people, there's enough um, information out. There's enough people who are out and who are visible, um, who have the language. So, you know, there is a, there is an ability or freedom for people to be out, for trans people to, you know, take class now and, you know, talk about that on the very first day and have the confidence to do that and to know that they can continue to do other roles and to explore, you know, their art. And uh, I feel like I went from a generation that was just before that point. You know, I transitioned like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And at that time, you know, successful transition meant, you know, becoming invisible and like a fully assimilating in society or like fully transitioning from one to the other. And now we're starting to understand that there is no one to the other. There's a spectrum and you can kind of fall where you want on that spectrum. It's kind of up, up to you. Um, and you can change where you fit on that spectrum, you know, per day, per hour or whatever. And so there's a freedom that is available now that wasn't available to me then. And, uh, you know, I'm really, really thankful that there has been this shift where people can be out and we can really see richly developed trans characters in work. And we can see trans actors taking on roles that are of the trans experience, that are like authentically of the trans experience because either they are listening to the actor or because they have trans writers in the room or somebody in the, in the production who has some something beyond their imagination to pull from when it comes to exploring trans experiences. But then also, you know, I can still play roles that are not necessarily trans based and that, you know, there's room for that. And now my hope is that we can continue in that direction because, you know, I was playing, you know, cis characters beforehand, um, before I came out to you and before, I, you know, I came out professionally, you know, with uh, Queen Sugar. Um, and now I've played like three very impactful and I think important diverse trans masculine characters and I'm really happy about that but I want to make sure that I'm still able to play some of the other roles that I feel like are important that explore the other aspects of my life and experience that I want to shed more attention to or just be a part of the conversation I'm a, I'm a black trans man and so some of the roles I want to do explore is my blackness some of the roles I want to do explore my transness some I want to do just explore masculinity or my idea my idea about it you know we're just being human yeah yes yeah yes I think the forced solitude really, and with, especially with like not, no social media, there's no sports to talk about. There's just so little to distract me from, you know, whatever things are kind of unprocessed, you know, that either of 
for myself, like personally, and then just like about the world, like it was just full steam ahead, you know, um, up until March and, and uh, April. And I had a lot of time to just kind of like sit down and, and let the things that were wrong with the world just really affect me and me listen to myself about how it was affecting me. You know, I, I felt like I'm really doing something with my art and my work, which was true, but people were still getting murdered. Black people are still getting pulled over for no reason and like, you know, brutalized by the police. We still have this sort of historical amnesia that, you know, contributes to this where people don't realize that the reason why things are the way they are based on how things were yesterday and the day before and like the 50 years before that. And we've never really dealt with these things. And I don't know, I think not being able to hide from or look away from someone being choked to death for eight and a half minutes just broke something in me and like, and, and everybody else was like, this is unnecessary and this has got to stop. And we can't keep throwing up the same excuses and like the same arguments about why it should be okay and hoping that it's just gonna, it's not gonna go away until everybody sees how wrong it is and everybody says, we're not gonna do this and stop relying on black people to like take responsibility for state sanctioned violence when it's not us. And for everybody, you know, who is complicit in it because they find some sort of benefit, whether it's a sense of safety or whatever, who finds some sort of benefit from this sort of white supremacy that authorizes this state sanctioned violence. You know what I mean? And I feel like we couldn't look away and we, we didn't have work to pull us away to keep us out of the streets and to keep us out of getting involved. At least like for me, I didn't have anything to do to say like, I can't go to this protest. I can't show up physically. Cause I feel like I was showing up artistically, but I'm like, this is a moment where, you know, in the sixties when the civil rights movement was happening, I always wondered like, you know, what would I have been doing in that time? And like, I'm like I don't want to be the person who's just sitting on my couch and like hoping that things are going to work out. And I could go show up because I'm having all these feelings to myself and I can't use my work to do anything right now. So I'm going to use my body. And I, for the first time in a long time, I really felt that pull to get out. And I feel like that was reflective of what a lot of people were feeling, where it's just like, we don't have, we can't look away and we can't pretend we're not feeling what we're feeling anymore. Like, I think the pandemic sort of sensitized our sense of humanity and our sense of connection to other humans and like our need for connection to other humans. And when, I, when we see other humans being attacked like that, being murdered like that, like, I don't know, I just felt pulled to, to do something more than I had done before to really contribute to the to the change. And so I feel like I went from a place of just kind of being very self-focused to a, a place of being more world focused and then more like direct action focused. And then, you know, feeling like sometimes like fatigue where it's like I'm out and I'm here, and we're protesting for days. The cycle is happening where they recognize there's a problem, there's an incendiary event. People respond to that event the, the, the uh, response, the anger comes out, the frustration comes out that, that should come out. And then to sort of undermine it and help us get back to um, reality, they demonize the people who are speaking out. They demonize the people who are like protesting. They're demonizing the righteous anger so that they can then criminalize it so that they can pull people away, break up the groups, jail people, and then get back to the status quo. And like that cycle was like, it was playing out now. And like, it's, it's exhausting, you know? So yeah. then- going back to a place of like, well, how else can I support? If I can't be out on the streets every day, if, if I can't, you know, create with, with my work right now, then okay, I can donate. Okay, I can share something. And then, so that's what I, I feel like I've been going through right now is just finding ways to be involved and finding ways to hold other people accountable and to make people who I feel like, well, not make, but to really challenge people who I feel like are aware of what's going on to move from their place of comfort, comfort and to, to help contribute to the direct action. I meditate. I mean, I think that's one of the, the things, like there was a moment where uh, when things were kind of coming apart and it was, and I'm on one coast, my wife is on another coast and uh, you know, I could either go to New York or even have her come here. And I'm like, I come here because we can, we can go outside. There's nature, there's the beach, there's sunshine and there's a little more space. And I feel like going outside, connecting with, with nature and just being present in my body has really help and like finding different ways to do that so whether it's meditation working out going for a hike that's that's been great I, I try to write you know from time to time but just really getting in my body has been really really helpful and um, choosing 
very carefully when I'm going to engage in media and the news. Like, I, I don't want to be cut off from things. Like, I, I, I don't want to be completely tuned out. So I want to be aware. But there's like a steady stream of garbage right now. Yeah. And I don't care. You like, you know, so just being very selective about like the news sources that I engage in and the social media feeds that I engage in as well, just to kind of get like a full perspective and then just not being on it all the time. So I like, you know, me and my wife been doing things like we learned how to play chess. So like playing chess for hours, doing like crossword puzzles, just really trying to find ways to get offline in a way that, you know, feels like gets me out of my like, out of the like uh, craziness of the world. Yeah out of like the repetitive thoughts in my head and like, you know, cause I'll get frustrated. Like there's, a lot, there's so much I can be doing. I should be doing this and this. And it's like, chill, you know? So finding ways to chill by either getting embodied or like getting engaged with another human has been really wonderful, wonderful partner to have, you know, for me is like, I'm very like head in the, not head in the clouds, but I guess, you know, I'm a, I'm a dreamer and you know, I, I pursue it. So it's been great to have somebody here who can like keep me rooted in love and to help me realize, you know, for me, a challenge that would come up for me in, like in class and just in work was like me not feeling a sense of like rooted worthiness sometimes. And so having her there like really reminds me and like she does a great job reminding me that like, I'm worthy of love and that this just yeah. well love, you know, for me. So no matter, and it does, I don't have to do anything. She's like, just you, it's just you. So even if I don't achieve whatever I've set out to achieve and even if I make mistakes or mess up, you know, she just loves me. And like, it's just so worth Like it just makes me realize like, oh, I'm worthy. I'm a lovable person. Okay. Okay. So my mom is great. She's a single mom. She and her sisters raised me and my cousin as siblings, but it was basically like me and, and her. And uh, I feel like it was challenging for her raising me because A, I had a lot of energy and I was very different than, than she was. And, uh, you know, just being like a, a trans child in the 80s when no one knew what that was and, and all that. So I think it, she took it personal sometimes that I was involved in things that like she wasn't interested in and that my rejection of like the things that she wanted to buy for me and the gifts and the clothes that she wanted, like I would reject that because it wasn't me. And, like yeah. I think we would, we, by the time I got to be in like middle school and high school, we were like button heads. You know? How did she feel about you wanting to play football? Oh man. So I didn't make the choice easier though. You know, like uh, I was a very wild and energetic and much as kid. And I was always very athletic. And uh, when I was in, middle school I wanted to play peewee league football with my friend and she's like no you can't play football I'm like you you, you gotta let me play like you can't let me not play and, you know I'm like if you can't let me not play and if the reason you let me not play is because I'm a girl then like you know that can't be the only reason and she was like you know she doesn't want to she didn't want to do that she didn't want to say that so she's like okay fine so finally after like years of pleading she let me play and I'm like yes I'm going to play it's going to be great I can't wait for summer but that winter I went sledding on a snow day and I broke my leg horribly so bad that like I was out for the whole year and like I missed the age cut off to play people league football. So I was like done for it. And uh, she was like, well, case okay, closed. But then I'm like, well, no, I'm healed now. I can play high school football. She's, <laughs> so she's like, no, no, you can't play. You're gonna break your legs, it'll be bad. And I like kind of hit her with the same argument. She's like, well, I'm not gonna support it. I'm not gonna get in the way, I'm not gonna support it. And so I was like, fine, I made my way. You know, I got on the city bus and I went to the school. And like, you know, I think it was because I was in Ann Arbor. It was a progressive town. And I think they just kind of figured football to weed you out. So you can try out, and if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you know, we can't say we kept you from playing. But I ended up playing, like, all four years, and, uh, you know, playing varsity and whatnot, and I uh, enjoyed it. But she was like, what is this? Like, of all the things. And then, like, I did track in the spring, and she was like, oh, great. You know, you're on the girls' track team. What harm can, you know, happen there? And I'm like, I'm a pole vaulter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I could put it through a lot of trials, and, like, it took some time. Like, it wasn't until, like, I went away to uh, college, and we kind of had some space where we started like really get into our own identities. And like, you know, I came back, I'm like, you know, this is who I am, I'm training. Like she had to like work her way around that. And it was yeah. difficult for her and it was difficult for me like processing how she felt about it and her initial like rejection of it. But then we got to a point where uh, like one of my, my aunts passed away and we were, everybody in the family was just like, we love each other, right? Okay, and let's just, let's just, let's just work from that. And from that, point like we've had like a great relationship because we were able to see each other for who exactly we are and like helping each other grow you know like she's tells me like she's inspired by the things that I do and like I'm inspired by the things that she does and we've been able to really you know grow this real relationship with the actual people we are once we're able to let go of the ideas that we held about each other for such a long time I started you know reading more because I had the time and I was trying to like get away from the screens and I noticed that the more like I would read the books the more like this like that imagination would just kind of light up and 
coming up with these ideas and connecting in a way uh, to things that just watching it doesn't allow. So like, you know, reading books, uh, reading scripts. And then like, I, I started to feel the urge to like play and like, you know, perform again. And uh, there's these uh, virtual, they can do it virtually. So like I did a couple like Zoom uh, readings of, of screenplays and scripts. That's been really fun. I'm a part of this uh, Make It Gay series uh, that this woman Gabby Dunn puts it on. And we'll read like screenplays from things like the social network or the breakfast club and we'll cast it with you know trans or you know characters of color and just like you know cross-gender casting and stuff like that so that's been really fun you know taking things like just turning on its head and playing characters i never would have thought of uh, playing before what and, was the most what was the most fun one you did uh the breakfast club i played the <laughs> i gotta play the job on the breakfast club and i just i had such a, a good time with that you know just just in general um and i think we're trying to either do the matrix or the hangover next so we'll we'll see about that but that that's been that's been great and oh no oceans 11 was also really fun because i got to do this like crazy british accent i was playing a don cheeto's character basher and like i just went to town with that you know so that was that was that was really fun and uh i did i was taking a class with this guy anthony apeson for like on camera auditions and whatnot uh, for a few months when i was in new york and uh, he was doing an online class so i'd pop into that like just to kind of just to get used to like exercising those like audition muscles when you get like the here's three pages, make something happen, come up with some, some choices. So just trying to find ways to stay sharp like that. But reading has been great. And then, you know, we have time now. So watching a lot of uh, television and like, you know, I have all the streamers. So I've seen like some really good like television. and, and Like oh, what? What are you loving? I'm loving uh, Rami is great. I, it comes on a Hulu. Um, and like, I would love it because it, I, I, I know I have Muslim friends. I know Muslim people, but I've never been in a mosque and I don't know their relationship to religion. I've, I've been to church and I have Jewish friends and I've been, you know, to temple, but it was really great to be pulled into that world and see the side of that, that, that space. And then seeing how, even though it's a different religion, he's navigating similar things that I'm navigating, you know? So I thought that was beautiful. Um, Anna Kendrick's love life, which I didn't, ex I wasn't even interested in watching, but it's, it's also really good in terms of, showing how relationships just kind of, they all kind of knock off each other and they change who you, how you see yourself and who you are and how you become like that. I thought that was, that was beautiful. Um, what you are experiencing while you're doing the training and in class is what you're going to experience in work at some point in some way. So you're getting trained on how you respond and react to things and like, how, what your process is going to be and it's going to be your process like throughout so even though you feel like running away like sometimes I'll get a script and I'm working and I'll feel like running away so I feel like class taught me how to know that that was part of the process this is what's going to come up and just know how to work with that and the stuff that comes up so it you know and there's going to be things that just click and come to you easy and you're going to do it and you're going to feel great and it's amazing like at your job and there's things that are going to come up in your job that are, are horrible. And so this is a good opportunity for you to learn how to work with the stuff that comes up when you're doing your work. Everybody should do therapy, yeah. but particularly us, because our instrument is ourselves and our feelings and our responses to things. And you got to know why you are responding the way to things. A, so that you can work with them. B, just so that you know. Like, I Great. feel like I'm a better person because the things that came up in class, I had to go get, I had to go work on them with a the therapist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the work that I did has made me a better person. I guess my first on camera thing was a, a commercial. It was an Eli Manning, uh, it was a Toyota commercial. Um, and the audition process for that, it was like, I felt nerve wracking because I think I was still either like, I just finished training, it was like 20, late 2012. So either I just finished the first year or like so somewhere in like some middle point. So I had all this stuff, like, oh, I'm ready. I got this tool bag of stuff to do. And then like, I got to the audition and it was like, you know, just be yourself in that moment. And like, okay. And like in the, in the commercial, it's like uh, me and my wife are like, you know, arguing about this lawnmower and I can't get it to start. And then um, Eli Manning shows up and he starts it with like telekinesis. And I'm like, wow. He drives a Toyota. So, like, that was, like, the concept of the commercial. I'm just so impressed. Not that the fact that he started the lawnmower with telekinesis, but that, like, you know, he drives a Toyota. And so, like, the the thing about it was, like, it's just this room, and, like, it's all this bombastic stuff. And I feel like everybody's going to stand in there and do the same thing, where they're going to go this, they're going to pretend that Eli Manny comes up, and then they're going to run away. 
So I was like, well, what am I doing? You know, like, can I just, how can I commit to the action at the very least? What am I doing? Like, I'm really trying to start this lawnmower. And I could sit here and I could just kind of mime it and pretend, but I was like, nah. So like, I remember like going in, I just had this impulse, like take off my belt and like wrap it around this piece of this chair and like do it, like really do it. <laughs> and I did. And like everything came out like in a real way because I was really trying to like do something. And so when the lady would like talk to me, I was like, what, you know, so it just had, it had like life and it, it made it fun. You know what I mean? And I, and I feel like that's, that's why it worked, you know, it was just like taking that. So like having all this, stuff, I got to do all this stuff and then just distilling it down to like, well, just what am I doing? Cause there's so much ridiculousness in here. And I had remember like I mapped out like, Oh, I could respond to this. And like, I could say this line this way. And I was like, just do it. I think what makes this funny is what it looks like. So if I do the action, it'll work. And I, and I feel like it works. Maybe not for a while, take any trans parts. And if you know any trans people, you can say, not me, maybe this person, and like give them a list of names. I, I, I started doing that um, just in general. Um, I, when people would reach out to me, like, can you be in my play? Can you be in this thing? And, like, I would feel bad saying no, but I realized like, I, sometimes I have, to, I have to say no, I can only be in like so many places at one time. So one of the things that I do is I say, I can't do it, but here's these actors that I know that I think would be good for it and like pass that along. So I feel like that's something that actors could do. You know, like if it's a paid role, uh, there's not that many trans roles. So maybe let's not, let's, let's stay away from that for, for right now. And let's advocate for people who are out and who are trans to, to take that role. I feel like incredibly fortunate that this is the moment, you know, that I've kind of, I feel like come to maturity as an, as an actor, as an, as an artist, you know, like I've known my whole life that this is what I wanted to do. But for, you know, all throughout my life, I'm like, I'm not sure how, you know, like how mm -hmm. am I going to do this? And who am I going to be able to be, you know, when I do this and what's going to be available to me? And then going through a, a period, I, I had a professor tell me like, you know, no one's ever going to see you for the stuff that you want to do. So like, why are you bringing in these things, you know, that, that I want to work on? And like, so feeling like he's right, I'm never going to be seen. So can I really do mm -hmm. this, you know, or should I really even try? Or should I just kind of worry about, you know, learning the behind the scenes stuff so that I can you know, create things, but maybe I don't get to act in, in, in this way, you know? So, and that was 2005, you know? So to go from that to where we are now, where I'm, I played three different trans men characters and not just like, you know, the cameo come in with some, some water and like, you know, oh, I had a botched surgery, like any of this like kind of sensationalist like crap, like really good, really well thought out humans. It's like next level. So I definitely know that I am a part of something that is brand new, that is impactful. I mean, I every day I get a message from someone, whether they're trans themselves or a parent of someone who's trans or a loved one of someone who's trans who's like, thank you for doing this. I didn't see myself and now I feel like I can do X, Y, and Z. So yes, it, I feel like it's, it's, it's incredible and uh, it is historic and I'm, I don't know. I feel like so honored to to be a part of it, and I'm so grateful that I am pre prepared to take it on. Like I'm so glad that I took the time to to get the training to really show up for these roles and this moment in the way that I've been able to. And yeah. you know, that's, why, that's why I keep working and keep training because it's like, yo, I've asked for this. I want to be able to hold it, you know. So I have this um, goal sheet where I like write down like what what my goal is. Like I, like one of the things I had to work on you know, with my therapy and whatnot, is like, be honest with myself about what I really want. And I felt like I was saying all of these like nice things, but that weren't really true. It was like, I really want this. So I had to get very, very specific. So I really specifically wrote out uh, in my like uh, goal sheet, like I want to play a trans male series regular role on an ensemble show that allows me to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I ended up booking the L word. So I thought, oh, that's it. And so then I changed it. And I'm like, I want it to be in a action-oriented, you know, first responder type show, you know, that keeps me in LA, blah, blah, blah. And like, as soon as I answered the question to my friend, I got the email and it's like 911 been off looking for black trans man, you know, well, I didn't say black, but it was like looking for a trans masculine actor, blah, blah, blah. Wow. So it was specifically written for a trans man. <coughs> I think the character was originally described though as like, uh, it's Midwestern, but it was like, you know, a bald, no, it was like a, a burly, uh, tattoos, ink sleeved and all this kind of stuff. Like, I don't have tattoos. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> I, was like, I just showed up, right? What was really cool about it was I did the audition and I'm thinking I was going to have to go through the whole process. Like I worked with Terry and I'm like, right, let's do this original audition. But then I'm, I'm probably going to have to do like a series 
uh, the, the, the screen test and the camera test and all this kind of stuff. And I got to prepare for these other the producer sessions. And it's like, I did that one audition and I, I booked it. And then when we came back for like uh, the, the table read or whatever, they had changed the character description to me, like black, bald. Wow. I was like, oh, oh. So that was like a, a huge moment for me where I realized like, you know, like, like something was for me, like literally for me, like that, this is my role now. Yeah, I think that there is a shift happening. Like, I think it was kind of happening at a snail's pace a little bit. And then there was still, like, a lot of, like, clinging to the status quo and then, like, hiding it under things. Well, financially, we don't know and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's not true because look at what these shows that are casting authentically diverse characters are doing. They're making money, so get out of here with that. So I feel like we were kind of moving in that direction. And I feel like uh, with where we are now um, and the awareness that people are having and like, people trying to be actively anti-racist as opposed to just increasing diversity, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it is going to take integrate not even integration but just like a stepping out of the way um at higher levels beyond our level as like actors it's not just the casting thing it also has to be like which stories are being greenlit to make it to the audiences you know what i mean and yeah. who's in charge of telling that story so you know what ava duvernay is doing with her like started with just distribution she's created a whole creative campus to like train people you know with you know throughout the industry either in front of the camera and behind the camera so that they are prepared to tell these stories and that they're able to bring their point of view into, you know, typically, I don't want to say mainstream, but into like what has been the mainstream right now. So like having a Kira Kelly as a director, a Domain David as a director, or, you know, as a, a, a DP of, you know, Latina female DP, you know, changes mm -hmm. things, changes how the stories are told. Like, so there is, there are a lot of initiatives that are happening. There's a lot of like calling in and calling out that's happening that makes me hopeful as long as people are willing to do the do it and step out. I mean, like Ryan Murphy's great about it, you know. Where yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> you know, he still keeps his fingers in things and like, everything could be better, but there are people who are like, let me put my money where my mouth is and like step out of roles that aren't for me or that are better suited for somebody else in this moment until things kind of level out. And then there's people who are on a, on a uh, executive level who are doing the, who need to do the same thing we're like kind of leaning into it but just need to like make sure that it happens so I'm, I'm really I'm impressed by the level of or the number of initiatives that I'm seeing happening for writers of color and for you know producers of color but it, it's going to take us continuously like pointing it out and like, hey, it's still a problem hey you're hiring black directors or, or black writers but they're not moving up to be showrunners mm -hmm. What's going on? You know, sometimes I could make something happen, and other times I couldn't. And I never really felt like I had any any control over like how I was performing. So I I, I never so then I was that question like maybe I can't act. I don't know. And so I kind of you know did a bunch of acting adjacent stuff for years, and then you know I made the decision to move to either New York or, or L.A. because I wanted to be closer to it. Um, and then I'm coming to New York, and while I was there, I I would run I would walk through sets and I would run into like people and they're like I'm an actor I remember I was in this bar this one time this girl's like I'm an actor I was like how how are you an actor like what do you do like what is, what and she's like okay calm down I'm, I'll meet me at the drama bookshop you know I'll answer all your questions blah 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 so we, we sat down we talked she gave me coffee and she answered all my questions it was, it was really really a wonderful experience like you know get this kind of guy and we went to the drama bookshop and I'm just like oh my gosh it's like you know the Willy Wonka's chocolate factory this is amazing and there's this wall of books and there's just all these books just about acting and different techniques. And I picked up um, Sandy Meisner's book. And then I also picked up um, William Esper's book and I'm reading it and I'm like, you know, it's, and it's, you know, the way it reads is as if you are in the class and like, I'm reading it, I'm like, this is what I've been missing. Oh my God. Like, and, you know, just the questions that were being presented in the book and then the way that it was being answered and how things were being broken down. And I was like, oh my God, I want to go here. And I'm like reading like, this is a real studio in New York, but I'm like, you know, all these name real actors that I respect and admire, like, going here. And I have, like, middle school credits on my resume. There's no way I'm going to go to this school. But I was just very drawn to it and, like, the way that I was describing acting. And I just – I carried it around for, like, two years. And I, I just I, – I went to the website one day. I was like, I, I'm going to apply. Because I'm telling all these kids I work with at the center, you know, to follow their dreams, don't let anything get in the way. But, like, I am not doing that. So I'm going to go on this website. I'm going to apply. And if I get in – Great. And if I don't, I took a step and I really tried it. And I ended up uh, going, I did the interview and I was all like nervous. I thought I had prepared like, you know, the audition. And I'm like, we, I talked to Terry about all kinds of things. And then, you know, I thought I didn't get it. Cause like I never performed. Like he didn't even want to see me act. Like this is terrible. 
<laughs> and then you know, I end up getting in the in the uh, summer program, and uh, it changed it changed everything. So that's kind of what spoke to me. just the way that it was described in the classroom, how the approach to, the, to acting, the approach to teaching was described in that book, like really drew, drew me to it. And then the summer program just showed me like this is exactly the kind of training that I need in order to unlock what I felt like was that sense of control over like how I perform. And uh, when I sometimes I get on set and like I'll kind of know that I'm working with another Meisner actor because they're willing to do kind of improvs. They're, you know, we don't always necessarily do the repetition per se, but they're, you know, they're willing to like jam a little bit to like drop into the scene. And uh, there's other actors who like, honestly, they don't have that. That's not their background. That's not their technique. And so what's great about uh, Meisner is like, I don't need them to necessarily participate in what I need to do to get, to get going. Once I get cooking, then I can work with them so they can just do whatever they want to do. There's people who you, I'm not, I, there's people I've acted with. I did not meet them until right before we started to shoot, but I felt like I was ready to jam because I knew what was going to get me going. And I knew what the scene was about and I knew what I was doing. <laughs> like that action and the, that doing is like, that'll bring it home every time. Especially for like me, like me as someone who's like cut their teeth on like law enforcement roles and like as a young person growing up, just really, really into like those kinds of, of, uh, of, of television shows. Like I'm like, well, what is it about that that like really draws me into these, into these kinds of uh, shows? And like, and it's like usually because it's some human who's trying very hard to do the right thing and everything's murky and gray and like, you know, maybe they don't make the right choice. And so that to me, that, that question of like, you know, how you're like one bad choice away from being a bad guy and one good choice away from being a good guy. I really like that dynamic and that sort of exploration. So for me, like, I had to like kind of understand that myself. I'm like, yo, what am I promoting here as a black man? You know, like being these cops and, and using these shows, you know, uh, sometimes where they, the, the relationship between the cops and the community is like so problematic. And like, again, it's reinforced these stereotypes that, you know, all the criminals are, you know, black and Latino, and, you know, all the cops are, like, these good white guys who are, like, trying to do the right thing, you know, and, and it's at our expense, basically. So, like, I don't – how have I participated in that? And when I was starting out early on, I was like, well, if I'm going to be in these cop shows, I want to be, you know, the good guy. I want to show that. I want to bring this blackness in my experience to that. And uh, I don't want to be playing, like, like, the criminals. So, like, that was kind of, like, a strategic thing, you know, early on because I knew I wanted to be in that world. And as I've, you know, been able to do it, the police and the law enforcement officers that I've been able to play represent what I want to see in law enforcement, what I want to see in this world. Like uh, Twan on um, on uh, Queen Sugar, he's a black police officer down in Louisiana. And I feel like, you know, for that character, he wanted to do that because of how police has shown up in his community. And so he wants to show up in the community in the way that is protective. And so he can be within the, the, uh, the police force checking that racism and that you know that oppressiveness that can show up in police and like humanizing black people because you know a lot of what happens with you know police brutality is like they dehuman they dehumanize it you know a lot of what they are taught in the academy when they get with the veteran they get paired with that vet the vet is like throw all that shit out and this is what it's going to be everybody is scum and if you want to get home to your family this is what you got to do and you can't look out for one minute you got to you know protect and it's like that's the attitude that causes so much, you know, death and destruction and violence and distrust within the community. So as a character, I want to play a character who is countering that, like, like with, on, you know, on the, on the inside. And so I was able to do that with that character. Um, and I feel like with, you know, uh, 911, it's like we're playing firefighters. So even though we're interacting with, with police, you know, we're, we're, we're still, you know, playing civil servants. But again, here, here we're showing like there's all kinds of people who feel this call to protect and to serve. And the way that it is playing out in this country right now, or actually the, like the whole time, that protecting the serve seems to only be reserved for certain people. And like, we need to do something about that. And we need to reevaluate what law enforcement is, you know what I mean? And how it's, it's carried out. And do we need law enforcement officers showing up for you know emotionally disturbed people, for domestic violence situations? No, not necessarily. And I think when, for me, when I say defund the police, I'm talking about spreading the resources that we are putting disproportionately to police and police force and spreading it into things that combat crime from the beginning, like education and after school programs and mental health services and all the things that have been cut, which is, which is why there's been a proliferation of poverty and crime and things like that. 
So when I say defund police, that's what I'm talking about. When I say abolish the police, when people talk about abolish the police, I think they're talking about historically and how the police have shown up and how they've been used and how they've been operating. I think there still has to be some form of law enforcement, but we need to reimagine what that looks like and how it's being used. And we can't do it unless we call for it. And if we use enough people are like, you know, use different language. Don't say abolish. Don't say defund. Like, no, say it because it got your attention. And it's actually kind of what needs to happen. Um, you are a badass is one of the things I read early on. Uh, Jen Sincero. Yeah, and then I read uh, The Gifts of Imperfection. Like, I did a, we did like a virtual family book club, Marie and I, uh, Renee. Um, yeah. I'm reading some like crime novel. This, like, I think it's a James Patterson crime novel, Big Bad Luck and Trouble, just because I, I like those, those kinds of stories. And like the way that he describes the, I love the, the descriptions of, of the locations. And like the mindset of the of uh of the characters, which is like you know when you read a script, they don't want to put that much in there, so you kind of lose some of that. So it's been really cool to like go back to like just reading like fiction, uh in in that way. But those are the two that I'm I've been primarily reading. My next one is um stories that stick, um by Brene Brown as well. And then Thomas Page McBee is a trans writer. He's a screenwriter. He actually worked on um the L Word, and uh, Thomas what? Page McBee. And what did he write? Um, amateur. And it's a, a really good meditation on like masculinity, his relationship to masculinity, masculinity and violence. And I think it's like really cool. I, I was right, working on this like op-ed and like, you know, I was talking about like how we're limiting ourselves. Like Hollywood has this limited um, um, imagination when it comes to trans actors, especially trans men. Like they don't even think about us. Uh, and when they do, it's like maybe for like a specifically trans part. But like, if you really think about you know, when you ask a man to describe masculinity or someone who's never really had to question it, it's like asking a fish to describe water, you know, or, you know, asking an earth, a worm to describe the earth. But, you know, if you talk to a frog, you know, we can talk about both and how they interplay with each other, how they're interconnected and, you know, give you some more perspective and how that's kind of missing, you know? So I, I think uh, Thomas, Thomas's book is like a great, great study on that for anybody to read, whether you're trans or not, you know, especially when you talk to look at masculinity. And I look forward to seeing you in the real, Brian. Yeah, baby.